Good evening. Uh, first, thank to Ambrosine and Sharon for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. Thanks, thanks for all of you to coming, and thanks to our, thanks to our uh, viewers in the live, se live feed. My name is Itai, as Sharon presented me, very, very in detail. <laughs> and before we start, I want you, your attention, please, to those cartoons. Is there anyone here that thinks that those cartoons are not anti-Semitic? For many reasons. <laughs> it's okay, I'm not judging. If, it, if it, It's okay. Okay, anyone can guess who published those cartoons? Iran. 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 More. Egypt. Egypt. Palestine. Pal PA. PA. Well, you were the closest, almost. <laughs> These were published by a human rights NGO, non governmental organization, called Badil, which is, happened to be in the Palestinian Authority. Is anyone have a clue here who funds Badil? Who gives them the money? The EU. The EU, okay, the UN. Iran. Iran. So Iran will be a <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, they received $251,000 from four governments in the last years, friendly governments towards Israel. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is only one country in the world that experiencing a well-funded and coordinated campaign against it. Mm. the State of Israel. Yes. And today I'm going to speak about the main actors that are leading this campaign, which are human rights NGOs, or more correctly NGOs that claim to promote human rights, but instead of that promote hatred. And specifically, where does the money come from? Now, a few words about NGO Monitor, with your permission. We are a very, very small research, research institute. 20 people exist in different forms for 14 years. It was an initiative of uh, Professor Gerald Steinberg from Bar Ilan University. We, uh, we 20 people, different backgrounds, different languages, different expertise. And we are basically the only place in the world that researching human rights NGOs from a critical point of view. We're asking a number of very basic questions. How come NGOs have so much power today? And why, when it's come to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, suddenly they become so political and one-sided? They neglect the universal values of human rights and become very political. And the third question is, where is the money come from? Today my lecture will be split to three parts. The first one will be more informative about how we and NGO monitors see the campaign against Israel. The second part, I will dive into to examples and cases where the, the British government gives money, whether intentionally or not intentionally, to anti-Israeli NGOs. And the third part, which is the most important part, for me at least, is to talk about strategy, discuss with you about strategy, what we can do about it, hopefully to think together to improve the impact and do like active things and not just uh, uh, talks in there. I will present also a few examples of successes that we had in order to, to, to see how, how a good strategy or bad strategy uh, should work. Just one, one request, don't worry, it's not about turning off your phones. I know that no one will will turn off the phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> but try to disconnect yourself from the discussion between right and left. Only for 40 minutes. Try to think about what I'm going to show you as a phenomenon that affects the Israelis, the Jewish people and their supporters all over the world. Now, I will take you back to the year 2001 to the city of Durban, South Africa, where the UN conference against racism were held. 1,500 human rights NGOs gathered together in order to speak and discuss how to solve human rights violations all over the world. As you can guess very fast, 
The only conflict that I discussed was the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Quickly, the Durban Conference became one of the most anti-Semitic events in the Western world after the World War II. Jews and Israelis were attacked. Violent demonstrations were held, like this. And flyers, this is a regional flyer from Durban, were handed to the participants in the UN Conference Against Racism. But why, why I'm mentioning 2001, Durban, why it's so important, you know, uh, uh, hatred toward Jews and Israelis has uh, long existed before. In Durban, Israel haters realized that you cannot win Israel by force anymore. You just can't. They tried and failed. Look at the history. 48, 56, 67, 73, 82, and I can go on, go on, 91, intifadas, they failed. So they changed the game. Now the rules of the game, the game itself. No more physical power, no more armies, no more the physical destruction of the State of Israel, but undermining the Jewish right for self-determination. Bullets have been re replaced by words. And the weapons are now not tanks and not suicide bombers anymore, but civil society organizations, NGOs. Durban, in Durban, something very interesting happened when they took all this agenda and put it inside one document that we call the Durban Strategy which lay the foundations of the campaigns that we see today. Those are the important quotes. And are not speaking about how they're going to achieve what they want to achieve. Not, they're not speaking about peace or coexistence or some normal solution to this unnormal situation. They speak about the total isolation of the state of Israel. That's it. Not what, what will happen after, not how we're going to achieve it. They lay an idea and they just open a door to any individual or NGO to do whatever they want or can in order to achieve this goal. And this, what we see here, is today look exactly like we see in the news. BDS, boycotts, divestments and sanctions. Lawfare, when you're abusing law in order to political persecute, politically persecute someone, like Israeli officials. Demonstrations, publications, all the things that we see today are happening in, a, in an extreme non-hierarchical uh, environment. You can, there is no, like, uh, the heads of BDS, there is no hierarchy or a commander that's telling them what to do. Each one interpreted the Durban strategy in their own way. I'm going to do a very dangerous comparison here, very dangerous. You know what is the challenging thing about ISIS, the Islamic State? That first and foremost, it's an idea. They don't, they, they're not military strong, they're nothing, they're a bunch of uh, terrorists on Toyotas. <laughs> but it's an idea. They lay the idea down and everyone all over the world that support ISIS take that and, and manage the tactics however, however they want. Now, like I said, the main players that, that exporting this agenda are non-governmental organizations, NGOs. Is there anyone that needs explanation about what is an NGO? No, yeah, right, very good. Great. Nothing with this activity, nothing is possible in order to do this activity without money. The key word here is money. Money, money, money. There are two main channels that human rights NGOs in the world get their money from. One is private, public donations, private foundations, uh, wealthy people. And the second channel, which is the more disturbing one, is from 
governments, European governments and also uh, Western governments, in, in, in order to do good, in order to promote human rights and humanitarian assistance, but some of the NGOs abusing this money. And this is where we're going to take you today, to look on this government money. Because we cannot really do something about the private money. If someone wants to, want to promote hatred with his own money, unfortunately, he will do it. But when a government that claims to be friendly towards Israel is doing it, whether intentionally or not intentionally, this is something we need to stop. And we in our research got into conclusion that 100 billion euros per year is going from European governments only to local NGOs and Israel and the Palestinian Authority that involved in this campaign. And this is only the number that we know of. Now the interesting part is that when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, suddenly very strange things happening. Lack of transparency, lack of oversight on the money, and also interests that are disconnected from human rights. I can understand if a government wants to promote the Palestinian human rights, but sometimes this is only a title and there are many other interests. Let's take an example. This screenshot, I don't, uh, you don't have to try to read what is here, this is the important quote. This screenshot is from 1999, European Parliament confidential, confidential document, when they speak about a grant from the EU to an Israeli organization called Peace Now, to do a peace project. Now, let's ignore the name of the organization, let's ignore what the name of the party, of the Israeli party that mentioned here, Likud. 400,000 euros for public education campaign focus on a social group that traditionally has anti-peace views and votes Likud. Disconnect yourself from its right or left. Read between the lines. The European Union giving money to an NGO in another democracy in order to manipulate elections, which is the, the pillar of democracy. You can do it by diplomacy, you can do it by the media, but they do it in the back door. And this is only an example. You know, an example of a, it's not for nothing this thing was confidential. And let's jump 10 years ahead. So don't, don't be afraid from the Hebrew. I will explain every, every, any, everything here. <laughs> Have you all heard about the NGO breaking the silence? Yeah. Okay, we will speak about it, don't worry. Here is an example from an official document about how they depended on their donors. All the donors here are uh, governments. Oxfam GB, which received their money from, from the British government. ICCO, 80% of the funding from the Dutch government. And the British Embassy. Now, Breaking the Silence claim that they are, the gra they are grassroots. They came from, you know, from below and they they taking soldiers and let them s tell the story. Let's quickly review what the donors wanted from breaking the silence. So Oxfam wanted as much as they can interviews with soldiers that would testify on immoral actions. For that they received 74,000 shekels. ICCO, which is the Dutch one, they want at least 90 interviews per year. For that, they will get 40, 42,000 euros. And the British Embassy uh, just generally wanted to uh, uh, just interviews for 271,000 euros. All is that after uh, Operation Cast Lead. Now, if you're telling me that it's coming from below and grassroots, okay. But here I'm showing you that it's all connected, the interest, the money, and the politics. Hmm. Let's dive in more. One of the questions I've been asked all the time is why? Why are they doing that if they know that their money is going to, to those things or not? Let's take one case that we in NGO Monitor managed to, uh, uh, 
to positively, posi positive effect on this case. The European Union gave 355,000 euros to a project for non-violent alternatives, which sounds amazing, a blessed thing in our violent area. In order to implement it, they chose two NGOs. One Palestinian, the Palestinian Struggle Coordination Committee, and one is Israeli Coalition Women for Peace. What I didn't know, that the Palestinian one is the one that also coordinating the violent demonstration in the West Bank. And also didn't know that the Israeli one is promoting BDS, which the European Union is uh, against, against BDS. They claim, well, well they claim they're against okay. BDS. We find out in Facebook that, w that the CEO waved a ter a one of the terrorist organizations flag, the Popular Front Liberation of Palestine, which is a terror organization according to the EU. So if I'm going back, the EU gave 355,000 euros to a project of non-violent to two violent organizations. <laughs> and this, all of this we found on Facebook and, and the internet. So maybe somewhere there or did a mistake or just, you know, close their eyes. By the way, after we published it, their, the support to, uh, to those two organizations from the EU stopped. Uh, the excuse, by the way, is a very interesting excuse. We are not funding the NGO itself, we're funding projects, which is weird. Uh, now, let's go specifically to uh, United Kingdom. This is your taxpayer money, which is go to the government, which is go to donations, to whatever uh, you choose. There are two main channels that affecting to on those NGOs. One is DFID. You all know. Mm. Uh, Department for International Development, direct money from the British government to local NGOs in Israel and the Palestinian Authority. The second channel is third party organizations, Oxfam Great Britain, Christian Aid, and the Norwegian Refugee Council that is not British but it's receiving their, their Palestine projects from the DFID. They're getting money from those from DFID or from donations from, from British uh, taxpayers. They themselves have political activity. They politically active in the Palestinian, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And they also fund the local NGOs. Sometimes there is the same NGO, sorry, the same NGO receive money both from directly from DFID and also from one of those. The amounts of money are tens of millions a year. Now, the British government fund many human rights projects all over the world for good, in, 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 a, in, a good, in a good cause, for a good cause. This number, uh, the 10,000 are, uh, 10 million, sorry, is not so high if you compare the, the, the aid money that's going to all, the, all over the world. It's not so high, but it's very uh, effective. It's actually set the course of how we're managing this conflict. We claim that this money, even with this good cause, is not doing anything good. It's going to a very narrow group of NGOs that promote very narrow agenda and cause mainly polarization between Israelis to themselves, right and left, between Israelis and Palestinians, and between Israelis and Europeans. Because when Israelis look on this quote, the Jews used the blood of Christians in the Jewish Passover that were published in 2013 upon Obama's visit in a website of an NGO that received money from at least 10 European countries, including the DFID until today. No one cared that they funded a project and not this quote. For the Israelis, they see the British flag on an NGO that is anti-Semitic. That's it. 
They don't care about. No one cares if you funded a project, if you, you don't, didn't met. No, the result is that British money is going to a place that is inherently anti-Semitic. Now, Christian Aid and Oxfam GB, let's look on this, in, in that example. There is an Israeli organization called Zohot. Ever heard about it? Yes. Remembrance in, uh, in uh, Hebrew. Now, they support the right of return. They support a one state that is not a Jewish democratic state. They're registered in Israel as a non-profit. Uh, but the thing is that they're actually very active. They're not just declaring it. They wrote documents that explaining how to dismantle Israel as the state today, how to build a new entity, what will happen with the Jews. Some of them with European passports will go back to their homes. Some of them are not. A real, uh, now, now this NGO is receiving a lot of money to, for, for, an, for a small Israeli NGO, for a small fringe NGO, getting a lot of money. And they're they, they wandering around in Israel and also uh, replacing names of places to their what they claim the ancient Palestine, Palestinian uh, places. So you can go into a forest <laughs> and you will see someone replace the names of, of, of the Israeli or Hebrew places in an in Arabic one. They have a, an application it's called iNakba. You can go to Google Maps and they will set a layer, a layer of, um, of, Palestine, of ancient Palestinian village on Israel. Now, I told you lack of oversight, that one hand don't understand what the other hand is doing. Oxfam Great Britain, someone that we know, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's in his room, approached us and say that he asked Oxfam if they gave money to Zuchot. This is the response. The response. At this stage, it appears that Oxfam GB has not ever funded or partnered with Zohot. Okay, which we chose not to believe them. Because if you're going to Zohot actual financial reports, the legal financial reports, you see <laughs> Ox from GB. This is 2012, maybe it's a mistake. 2013, Ox from GB in Hebrew, Okay, here your Christian aid. Uh, this is uh, the, the church. The church in Switzerland, also funded by the government. Oh. The church in Germany. 2014. This is their, from their website. Oxfam GB, 25,000 uh, shekels. They they say this is from a foreign country. Uh, everything is transparent. We are, the, the level of transparency uh, in Israel, when it comes to NGOs, is very high. If you if you compare it to other countries. Mm because of a law that passed in 2011 that we were part of the uh, of the organizations that pushed this law that is not speaking about the activity of the NGOs but rather we want to know every three months which countries funded which NGO in Israel then the public can know what's what's behind the NGO next terrorism now I will not lie when we research uh, we have more than 200 NGOs that we research. There are only, there are maybe four or five cases that we found out that NGOs were involved also in a, in a pure ter terror connection. They know how to, to, to careful, they know how to not to go into it. Uh, it's also another level of uh, activity. Now, Islamic Relief Worldwide is one of the largest Islamic humanitarian organizations in the world. They do amazing things in places that the West is not even coming, like arriving to it. In 2015, after 2014, sorry, after uh, Operation uh, Protective Edge, Moshe Yaelon, the Ministry of Defense, the ex-Ministry of Defense. Uh, he declared that they find out, the security uh, service, find out that the official branches of Islamic Relief Worldwide, IRW, in Gaza and in East Jerusalem, Israel led them freehand to, to work, they were involved on terrorism in uh, raising money for the Hamas while we 
fodder. So they took Islamic relief worldwide out of the law. They declared, they declared that I'm a terrorist or a terror organization in Israel. Just to know, it's a very difficult process to take an NGO that work or a, or a body that already works in Israel and to declare it on a, as, a, as a terror organization or as a NGO that cannot gather. It's a very sensitive uh, thing to do with a lot of political implications. But they've done it, so probably there was something behind it. The first day we heard about it, we went to see who funds IRW. So almost every Western country in the world giving money to IRW, to humanitarian, process, to humanitarian things. And we also found out that the British government gave, gave the money. So we raised the question, did you know that your money is going to, it, to terror? That's it, to fund terror. They actually checked it in the um, House of Commons. Yeah, House of Commons. Uh, they, they actually checked it and got in the conclusion that uh, there wasn't anything bad of this funding. Uh, but others uh, concluded uh, otherwise. Uh, the big bank, the huge bank, HSBC, you be honest, bank, they declared they're shutting down the relations with IRW because they, they fear of connections. They even didn't you know, find any connection, just they feared. And we accept, our expectations are from governments that share this responsibility to at least provide answers how come the money arrived to a body that was involved in funding terror while Israel was in a war. Back to the DFID, and this is, I am, I will pass here some, some things. This is our latest update for a report from 2013, which speak about a British government, a DFID grant to a Norwegian humanitarian NGO that, need, that taking this money and implementing this money with the local NGOs in order to promote legal projects in Israel and the Palestinian Authority. What does it even mean? Legal projects, if you looking in a very positive way, means that I'm helping, let's say, Palestinians or whoever need help in legal processes in order to protect them, in order to uh, to achieve better life. This is in a perfect world. But just look on a one uh, quote from one of the lawyers that active in this project. Every possible legal measure to disrupt the Israeli judicial system, increase the workload, blockage. Imagine yourself such a thing happening in the UK. That a project funded by, let's say, Germany, and you'll find out that the, the the actual purpose is to just hurt the country, to shut down the democracy. Now I spoke also about transparency. Uh, is that work, David? <laughs> Let me restart it. It's not flipping. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so let's let's look what the real deal was. Instead of helping, instead of improving the situation, first we found out in this update that they're collaborating with the Palestinian Authority in Israeli courts. Combat the impunity enjoyed by Israel. Over 4,000 legal cases. We found out that one of the NGOs that were implementing this project called for a legal intifada. Others called for BDS. And all that was British is British money and lead on Norwegian and the European Union. Now I said lack of, we know that they, because of our research, but when we try to go to the UK aid transparency system and see this specific project with a 5.5 million pound, the very same project, receiver organization is supplier name withheld. So me, for example, as a British, uh, regular citizen, ordinary citizen, 
that don't know how to do research, that does not have the abilities of NGO monitor, if I want to know where is my 5.5 million pounds went, this is where I stop. I cannot, just can't. I know it went to the Norwegian Refugee Council and they decided what to do with it. Now, breaking the silence, which also get money from Christian Aid and used to get money from the UK government and from Oxfam. What is the problem with breaking the silence? If I, I, I'm asking you, if anyone, a, a brave volunteer in one sentence can explain it, why Israelis are so mad at breaking the silence. Because they don't actually make concrete allegations that can be investigated by the system, and that's supposedly their raison d'etre to change Israeli behavior and combat supposed human rights violations, but they just basically tell stories with, that are so vague that you can't actually check okay. whether anything. They're anonymous, I think. Anonymous, yeah, the, the, the testimony was anonymous. Okay. And another one in <laughs> There isn't any silence, is there, to break? I, I, I mean, people talk about everything in Israel all the time, don't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Their, their output is all in English. Uh, it's in Hebrew, Hebrew, but it's also in uh, seven different languages. Okay, I see all the time in English. So, <laughs> the, I, I'm very uh, personally connected to uh, the breaking the silence thing, also because I'm I was a combat soldier. I. Uh, I participated in a combat situations. I was also, uh, I was also a medic in my unit, so I, I know when you need to make tough de de decisions on very specific humanitarian issues in the same point. The problem with breaking the silence that are not talking to the Israelis anymore. They talk in Israel. They talk in Hebrew. But instead of being what they meant to be in the start in 2004 to promote a discussion inside Israel about the moral complicities that we have in the conflict, they became a political organization that abusing the moral dilemmas that our combat soldiers have. And trust me, you have many moral dilemmas in this conflict because it's not black and white. The gray area here is huge. And they take this, and I'm, I'm joining all the things that you said, take this, taking fractions of stories, lack of context, lack of political context, lack of operational context, they're not published the names of the people, they make a nice looking report, they just publish it, with the conclusion that uh, the conclusion is that Israel needs to withdraw from the West Bank. Now, I'm not arguing about the, politi the, the political statement. I'm just arguing, leave the IDF alone. Don't tell me you are a, you are a human rights activist when you, all, all, you, all you do is taking stories and using them in order to, to promote a political idea. If you really want to speak about the moral dilemmas we have or the moral price, come and speak. Let me show you that each quote that you gave in this Breaking the Silence report, there is 12 different versions. You know, in combat situations, when you briefing yourself after, you will take 10 soldiers, ask each one of them to, te to tell you what's happened, you will hear 10 different stories. And when you go back to the first one, his version will not, will not be the same as like his first version. And everything is simplified. Now add to that the fact that more than, 50, more than 60 percent of the funding is from European governments, which means a lot for Israelis, which have a, a very symbolic uh, sign. Can you, can you believe that, that the French government will fund a British NGO that will research <laughs> British soldiers, when they back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and then take their testimonies, edit them whatever they want, and go with it to the United Nations to show how much the British are war criminals. Can you imagine what the British government will do to the French government? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's happening. It's things that in Israel it's happening. Now I'm adding more. Some of the funders 
are the same funders that involved in the BDS campaign, in in different forms. You know, the BDS campaign is is you can choose many uh, tactics and strategy. Mainly church organizations, by the way, like Christian Aid and, and so and so. Now, one other problem is the venues that they go to. So suddenly, this this picture of Avner Gvrayao, one of the one of the leaders. You know what Press TV is? Yes. Pre okay. <laughs> so he spoke in the subcommittee, or one of the subcommittees of the UN, a very extreme one, with, uh, with uh, Malaysia, Pakistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, whoever you want. A subcommittee uh, that dedicated specifically to the rights of the Palestinians. He spoke. The first one to broadcast were the Iranians. Israel war crimes. He just whitewashed everything. Now, Why? whether it's intentionally, or not. The question is, sorry, well you said it's interactive now, but why yeah. does he want to do it? Okay, so there are, there are the, the why, <laughs> if we specifically are breaking the silence, the why is uh, split a few, let's say, dimensions. One is there are people that are strongly believe, that they believe in it, that if they will push the world to push Israel, Israel will have better future. They, they honestly believe that Israel will have better future if we will do X, Y, Z politically. And the way to do it, because the Israelis are not, not want, they don't want to listen to them anymore. They're a pariah NGO in Israel, in, Israeli, in the general Israeli public. You think they have such good intentions? No one, I didn't say that. I say the wise. Like, there are people. No, but that, that, but that, that assumes that they are doing it in good faith. Rather than just saying, so let's, can, let, let's I assume. Make, I can make uh, some good. Let's money assume, but I also, but let's uh, let's hear let's hear more. But sorry, you said before that some people were being paid to do this. Yeah, things. exactly. So the first dimension is people that are actually doing it. The other one, look, what I presented here and what will I will present. There is one word to describe it: industry. Industry with workplaces, with money, and with fame. Don't forget, don't forget it. The, the, the personal connections those people have in the State Department in the US, in the, Parlo in the European Parliament, and I was there when, when they were there, they connected to everyone. They lobby there, they, give, they get the money, for example, from the, uh, the Irish government through one of the church organizations, and then take the money, go back to Ireland, and make campaign. Yes, there is also the dimension of of the, the physical dimension of money, and it's they, they are all interconnected. Now, don't forget that today in the Western world, to be the underdog is a is an advantage. To be, they take the campaign against them and use it, use it very smartly. They use it. They raise money by it. And by the way, it's come, it, let me think, like I'm throwing you a, 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 a hint about thinking strategy. Not always to frontly attack an NGO is a good, uh, is a good strategy, because sometimes they take, talk, take these attacks and use them. They portray themselves today as the ones that are being hunted in the streets. I heard one of their, uh, their former um, CEO in the European Parliament Telling that uh, people uh, beating them in the streets, which is no, which is nonsense. They are all over the media. They are all over the, they all over the universities. Yes, people don't agree with them, and shouting loudly. And it's funny that a, an NGO that based only on criticism is afraid when someone in democracy criticizes them. It's a interesting thing. Now, if we're already in army issues, another example of how, how the mechanism work, how it works. And I will start from, I will do it backwards, I'll start from here. Every <coughs> war that we have, every operation, there is this debate, how many Palestinian casualties are terrorists and how many are civilians? 
and then some weeks after the world is you know straight setting itself on a straight line of a number after protective edge in 2014 the number was 50 50 israel killed 50 percent terrorists 50 percent civilians we in ngo monitor try to check how who who, who pub, what, what is this number who came to in, into a conclusion that this is the number so we went to the number that the UN published, OCHA is the humanitarian uh, aid support uh, organization of the UN, and we saw that the numbers are quoted from a report of three NGOs, two Palestinian NGOs and one Israeli. Yeah, but uh, perhaps that's not really the real problem here, whether it's 50% or 66%. No, it's not. It's the, the, the problem is <laughs> the fact that the, all of these organizations are singing a song and putting out misinformation which is falling on very fertile soil because yeah. they're telling people what they want to believe. And, the, and many people in the world and all these organizations, they want to believe the worst of Israel. Killing babies is fantastic. They love that more than anything else. So what, what can you actually do? You know, what can you or the Israeli government what the, the situation you're describing is quite familiar to some of us, I yeah, think. Yeah, right, know? of course. So, but it would, I would be more interested in hearing what you, or at NGO Monitor, or the Israeli government can actually do to combat this. This is effectively lawfare, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah. Because Israel can't be defeated militarily, so there's another This way. is why I'm here today. Oh. The, 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 the reason, no, really, the reason that I'm here down. today is down. first to lay, the, to lay the problem, to show you that the problem can be uh, we see the problem in NGO Monitor specifically. I will give my analysis on the bigger picture, but in NGO Monitor, the problem for us is the funders. The funders are the enablers. If you don't have money, you can scream and shout however you want, and no one will hear you. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> we do that. And we, 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 we always think about today to hurt someone politically. Okay, let's say I blame you for being anti-Semite. Okay, so I blamed you. So some of them uh, the, the, are proud for uh, being anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. But if I'm pulling the plug, I don't care anymore that you will be anti-Semite. No one will hear you. You don't have money to travel around the world. Now, it's not only this. This is a very uh, black and white picture, but I, I want to give... Uh, I will speak about strategy now. I just Can you just say... Uh yeah, sure. again, what's the name of that organization that checked uh, every single one of the It's camps? the, um, um, I know it in Hebrew, uh, the Center for Intelligence and uh, Terror Research.